Welcome to another episode of Matbach. Our special guest is Judy Kala, who has been working as a chef for over 16 years, having trained at the prestigious Leith School of Food and Wine. I hope I'm saying that right. Judy has worked at restaurants such as Pengeli's under Ian Pengeli, uh, Daphne's and Papillon with Michelin uh, starred chef David Duverger. Du- Duverger. <laughs> Duverger, excuse me. <laughs> um, most people know Judy for her incredible work under the name Palestine on a Plate, which is the name of her first book, as well as her um, Instagram page, which is how I first found out about Judy's work as well. And she's also the author of uh, Baladi, the other cookbook that has been a smash hit. Judy, welcome to Afrika. I'm really, really happy that you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. And it's been 25 years. I wish it was 16, but it's 25 years now. (laughs) Oh my God, 25 years. Yeah, that needs to be updated on my website. Yeah, so your bio is nine years old. (laughs) Yes, I I told you already, I'm a dinosaur with technology and things like this. I kind of just put something out there and leave it. (laughs) Well, my favorite people in the world are the people who don't care about their bios. So... um, that's a, a good <laughs> it's a good start. I like that. Um, let me ask you the first question, I guess, which is how did you start caring about cooking? Did you uh, think you were going to go into the world of food when you were a high school kid or college kid? No, uh, to be honest with you, I never really even thought it was a job, stupidly. I mean, I don't know if it's stupid or not. I just... I thought like when we went to restaurants, the food was just there. I didn't think about who made it and what was behind the scenes of the dining area of a, of a restaurant. Um, although I knew how it was made because we eat at home. But I, I started cooking really because I was just quite distressed as a kid. And there was a lot of us. And um, my mom just sort of kept me next to her to cook. And eventually, as I was getting older, you know, having hormonal teenage years and getting a bit older and not able to control my mind I started cooking as a way of I I guess now looking back as therapy for myself um, it just helped quieten my mind and put me in a place where I felt really really happy Um, and I just uh, even just last week a friend of mine was saying oh do you remember those nights when you just wake up in the middle of the night Uh, and start cooking it's because I woke up because I was having a panic attack or something and the first place I would go would be the kitchen to just take anything and make something and then go back to sleep because it would just yeah Uh, and I just loved it I love the experience and obviously experimenting and learning from my mom and my aunt yeah were you a lot of things were the things that you were doing and the things that you were making at the time food that um would eventually find its way into palestine on a plate or were you sort of making lasagna and you know pizza or like um mac and cheese like what were you making at the time i wasn't making those kind of foods because i was trying to eat myself better um Mm. because i didn't want to go on medications and things like that which are great if you need them but i was trying to use foods in a healthy way to kind of create this amazing experience in my brain to help me reduce the anxiety and of course you know you are what you eat if you eat junk yeah for sure not your junk but you're not going to feel good and uh, yes a lot of those things did by accident end up in both of my books uh, but but were they I guess what I'm trying to ask is was your conception of food at the time um, food that comes from a traditional Palestinian table even then? Or were you sort of like, was that part of the therapy? That's what I'm trying to ask. Yes, definitely, definitely. Because who was I learning from? My mom and all the foods that she cooked were all Palestinian dishes. I mean, she didn't know anything else. Uh, So it was all the things that she made just faster and quicker and and shorter (laughs) ingredients just to make it happen in two hours instead of six. Um, But yeah, definitely. It was from her um, cooking that I was sort of deviating into my own space. You know, it's so funny, like uh, making it accessible. Food, the domain of food is is unique in in a sense because, like, if I was like, if I grew up thinking I really wanted to be 
a novelist or a writer, or a novelist or like a lawyer or a doctor, or all these different things, right? I probably wouldn't learn by the at the side of my parent, mm-hmm. right? And parents are often they're complicated. They're your biggest critic, and they drive you crazy in so many different ways. Like, what is it like to develop your technique, your professional technique, w- under the guise of your of your mom? Honestly, uh, my sister Maya, she's not on here because she's in Qatar and had the most vicious arguments because if I didn't make it the way she made it, it wasn't right, right? So there was no room for me to have my version of something because then it's not okay. Like I made a dish, I posted it, she saw it. She's like, yeah, Judy, there's no kamun in this dish. I said to her, yeah, but I put kamun because it hurts my stomach if I don't eat it with kamun. Blah, blah, blah. She goes, then don't say it's Palestinian. So I was just like, no, mama, it's Palestinian. And it's stupid little things like this, but she's so authentic. If it goes one degree over, it's she has to call me and tell me. But in the same hand, I love that because it keeps me sort of in a track to keep focusing on what she's teaching me and also knowing that just because I added Kamun does not make it not Palestinian yeah Uh, it's my version of it and she has to sort of accept these things and I love it I think it's important it's like it's very difficult to put a final thing it's very difficult full stop (laughs) yeah because even even the even the tagline here right memories from my mother's kitchen yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, yeah my memories from my mother's kitchen I should say it's uh it's definitely my version of things but yeah so uh, like her mom taught her I'm sure she made amendments and she's for sure made and also people who cook my dishes make their own amendments to suit their flavor their taste their you know their palate of the day you know it's not you never know maybe maybe her grandmother put kamun you never know maybe i'm sure she did (laughs) i'm sure she did it didn't come from nowhere (laughs) yeah um so let me i want to jump into palestine on a plate um do you remember the moment where you decided that that was the name that you were going to stick with Yes, actually, uh, I was finding it very difficult to find a name for this because Palestine on a Plate was not the title. It did not have a title. It it just had memories from my mother's kitchen and I couldn't think of anything. And my friend, Steph, he's Palestinian also. We had created an app and we couldn't think of a name for this little app that had 15, 20 recipes on it. Is this pre, sorry to interrupt, is this pre-Instagram, pre-social media? This is pre sort of having those accounts? just i didn't even have instagram at this point but instagram was there um okay and I, i'm not very good at these things and then we were sitting going back and forth thinking and then steph uh he he came up he actually came up with the name um and we were coming back and forth and i said to him stop what did you say and he was like repeating i was like no the other one and then he said palestine on a plate i was like this is it like just write it down so we don't forget <laughs> and then we created the app and just sort of left it there. Again, uh, just hoping that people would find it by accident, which of course they didn't because you need to tell people things. And then he he created my Instagram page without telling me. Um, And then he's like, hey, listen, there's 5,000 people following you. Can you take over? And I was like, take over what? Um, (laughs) Wait, wait, hold on. (laughs) Wait a second. He created the Palestine on a Plate Instagram account. Yeah. Posting your what? What was he posting? Posting all my food pictures and tagging things. I didn't even know what hashtags were. Nothing. I didn't. I was just busy working, doing other things. And then when he didn't, he didn't know what to reply to people because he's not going to fake being me. He's like, people are asking questions. I don't know. You have to take over. And then I got onto this Instagram with five thousand followers. I was like, okay, this is cool. And it just, he gave me the password and I just went with it. Um, so how yeah. Funny. I, <laughs> and how many I, other, how many other accounts has he launched into? <laughs> He's launched loads of accounts actually, uh, but not, not food accounts, but yeah, he, he was great. And this is how it all started really just sitting in my house, uh, 
after I had lost my business, I was working in a company that I hated uh, because that wasn't my job and just wishing my life to be different. And he was doing all the stuff in the background to sort of get me back on track. Um, He's like your fairy godmother, this guy. Yeah, yeah, he is. My old, one of my oh. oldest friends. So, and that's how Palestine on a Plate came to be. And then I finished writing the manuscript of the book and I presented it as Palestine on a Plate. Um, yeah, and the rest is history. It was, uh, it was amazing. <laughs> so, you know, like, okay, I have to ask you this question. And I feel like chefs are unique in this way. Maybe not unique, but it's a function of what it looks like to be a successful chef in 2022. Insofar as I feel like there's many functions that you have to perform. You have to write a, uh, a cookbook and learn how to be a pub be successful in publishing. You have to be a social media whiz. You have to actually be competent in the kitchen and come up with recipes and also perform those recipes. You have to also cook for people and food has to go into their mouths and not just look good on the page. And then on top of it, you also have the added burden of having a social mission. You're not just like celebrating, you know, like wine from Napa Valley. You're like talking about something else, right? So my question to you is, which one of those is your least favorite? And which one of those are you like, I wouldn't do it unless I could do this part? Okay, I don't like any of it. Um, <laughs> it's not natural. It's not natural to be, here's my phone. I'm holding it with this hand. I'm not left-handed. You have to zoom and move up and down. I know they have these tripods and things. They don't work for me. The steam hits, then the film gets fuzzy. Then you're cooking and chopping and then you're coming. It, it's not normal. So most people have a friend or a partner or somebody to hold things and move with them. Great that's fantastic but doing things by yourself I'm not very motivated if you see I don't post that much um a because I think it's a lot when I see people posting every single day I don't yeah. post because I want numbers I post because I've made something I think it's delicious I want someone to know and I, I post it and it's once every two three weeks and khalas because also there's a lot of uh, just stuff happening people also forget behind your phone you have bills to pay you've got parents to look after or see you've got family you've got work you've got bills uh, like not bills but like accounting you've got to see so yeah. you have to be in a box they need to be ticked off and yeah. I, I really take my hat off to people who are just on this non-stop because I know how much work it takes and I do it badly you know, like I look at people's reels and things. I'm just like, wow, how do they do? And I message them like, how did you do this? Uh, and they're like, oh. I and it's like, it's Steph, Steph on the other account. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, I mean, I'm coming over. Yeah, I'll show you about you. <laughs> uh, I, there's lots of people who might be watching this replay. They know who they are. I message a lot of people like, how did you do this? What did you use to make this happen? And they're like, oh, I just had a camera on the side and one on top and one here and one there. I'm like, so you have five cameras to film like uh, whatever eggs. And then it's like, yeah, this is not my life. I have better things to do, but it's the one thing I love to do is um, when I post something, when people, um, it triggers a memory for them and the nostalgia and stories, that's what I love when I see that, oh my God, this reminds me of my mom. This reminds me of my theater. My granddad just did this. This is someone taught me this when I was young. I haven't eaten this in 20 years. Or, you know, some not so nice stories, but memories of people's parents who have passed away and they've never taught them something and they want to learn. So it's that, that's what I love the most about um, Instagram or any yeah. social media is that you've touched a nerve in somebody in a nice way, Taba, and you don't want to hit someone badly. And it just evokes something. Um, for me, that's the whole point of cooking. It makes me feel good. It makes me happy. And it takes me away from anything, let's say, bad, which is the world right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> what about the the other side, the actual... Um, the the actual like putting food in somebody's mouth part like do you like um as your career has developed do you like the idea of 
writing down recipes and crafting them versus actually feeding people? Like, it, maybe it's a stupid question, but I, I'm so curious about that balance. Writing recipes is for me the most unnatural thing to do because I don't cook with measurements ever. I cook with yeah. my eyes. Except for baking, obviously you need to know how much things are, but I don't bake that much. I'm more into the tabikh and things that I just take. Yeah. Uh, so for me, my pleasure comes definitely in cooking something that I don't have to measure and feeding people and seeing the, the reaction on their face. I mean, 90% of the time people love my food, 10% they're okay with it. And then they don't like it because it's not the way they make it. And I totally yeah. respect that. I've eaten loads of people's food that would be considered incredible, but I didn't particularly like it because it didn't hit something in me. Doesn't mean that it's not good, right? And I yeah. think this is a lot of, I think a lot of people need to respect that people have um, tastes and we can't hit every single person's one. Um, and not to take things personally. I used to take it very personally before. But back to your question, writing recipes for me was the hardest thing to do for, for the books um, because uh, it just doesn't make sense. But I had to do it, obviously, and it took me the longest time. Uh, it took the longest thing in the books to, to actually write the quantities of things because taking yeah. out, measuring, taking it out, starting again. Uh, because if you ask me to make it on the spot, I'll make it perfectly. But if I have to measure it, I, I make a mistake and then I have to start again. <laughs> yeah but it's worth it in the end obviously because um ultimately people are buying the books they're loving them and the recipes are working so thank god yeah. <laughs> I did quite. i've heard you tell the story about um about getting the 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 story about the title yeah. about this book um so were you surprised, and if, if you can just give a, a primer, like this idea of this title, Palestine on a Plate, like an Instagram account, you can, you can make any name you want. Yeah. So, but then you have this successful Instagram account and you're like, all right, I'm going to make it into a book. Yeah. Um, tell us about the struggles, the idea, the pushback you got. Well, to be honest with you, I mean, this might have been really naive of me, but I really didn't think of it. I just thought this is a great title. It says the country. It's literally the food of that country on a plate. Like it was simple, super simple, super basic, but it said everything I wanted it to say. And I never really stopped to think that there would be any um, backlash to it initially because I was very sort of singular nucleus on my own, doing my own thing. I never really interacted with anyone in the like outside world, i.e. social media and beyond. Um, and I had a restaurant before for three and a half years and no one ever said anything about it being Palestinian. So it just sort of yeah. was like, I did for me, like nothing, no big deal. Yeah. But then when one publisher another after another after another after another kept saying great book we love the content we love the manuscript of the book but uh, we're not happy with the title because it's too of course i know being palestinian is political in the context of israel the uk america um but 99 percent of the world are not uh politically against us or quite you know quite yeah. us so it was once it came to light, I kind of, I got really depressed. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I went into a really big depression thinking that no one's going to publish this book because of Palestine and I would not change it. You know, they said to me that we would consider it if it was this or that, but I said, no, I don't, I don't really care. You, people don't make money from cookbooks just for your reference. So it wasn't Osset Masari or, you know, it wasn't a thing about money. Yeah. It was uh, like, no, I'm not going to make it like a Levantine book or a Middle Eastern book. I wrote it for a reason. And if they weren't going to publish it that way, there was no way it was going to get published for me. Um, and then yeah. with her, I spoke with her. Uh, she was on the fence. And 
I just told her, like, trust me, just because there's the rest of the world and clippings from news and things that she could see, like what's happening actually now in Qatar, as an example, um, yeah. with all the fans from every match holding Palestinian flags and what have you. I mean, obviously I didn't show her that because it didn't happen, but there were similar things. And she saw actually that the rest of the world loves us and supports us. And she sent me an email saying, let's do it, but we'll do a small run just in case. We'll see how it goes. I'm putting all my eggs in your basket, basically. And yeah. that's it. That's how it happened. And, you know, I, I love that she took that chance with me because it was the first book that had Palestine on it. Um, and um, yeah, she's very happy now. <laughs> so it's interesting because um, it's, it's, it, it's funny because like, like, sorry, can you, did it yeah, cut? I can hear you. I can hear you. I was going to say, it's funny because it feels at first like her objection would be a political objection, but it's not. It's actually an economic, uh, economic objection, a financial one. She's like, oh, you know, cash rules everything around me and I'm, I'm not going to sell enough. I'm not going to sell enough copies. And you're like, it will sell. It will sell. It will sell. Exactly. It, it did. <laughs> yeah, and it that's did. great. It will, it sold enough to to ask her to write me a second book um which yeah. i did um which is already half written because i couldn't put everything in palestine on a plate um because there's so many yeah. but yeah it was it was a struggle but listen i think uh, with everything not everyone's gonna say yes um not everyone's gonna see your vision or believe in you and you just have to keep believing in yourself even when you don't you just have to lie to yourself and this is like my advice I would give to anybody. Uh, if anybody knew me back then, they would have remembered how depressed I was. I couldn't speak to anyone. I just thought, my God, people don't even know who we are and they wanna just not help us show the amazing things that come from our country um, because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And uh, it really, really got to me. Um, but, you know, yeah. yeah. With time and, and, and conversation and educating, I think that's the most important word. Um, and working with people who have, who think outside of the box as well. Um, and it worked. And I, I Do you do feel that. like you've seen a, 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 the needle move since then? Because I feel like, um, you know, in the early 2000s um, and you know, subsequent years, and any time I would go to a store, you know, like uh, in the U.S., the classic examples like the Sabra Hummus, right, is like an Israeli company, right? That's like the classic, classic example. Um, have you seen a needle, uh, the needle move where more and more people are realizing, wait, hold on, this is appropriated food. We actually need to be eating uh, food that's like from Palestine or from the Arab world more broadly and actually understand what's happening. Have you seen that change? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak about the rest of the world, but definitely here in the UK, um, everything is changing. People have to be very specific about where certain ingredients are from. You can't just say, you know, oh, tainé, a Middle Eastern, you know, uh, paste. It, you know, they have to be specific. Summa, what they use it for. Um, and also not just saying it's uh, Lebanese or, you know, Palestinian. Very specific areas of certain countries. They want to be known for that specific dish or that specific uh, seasoning so yeah. it's very it, here again it's very important i've noticed that people are sort of standing their ground about where they come from their identity they want to reclaim it and they're doing so really well and they are allowed to have that space for palestinians i mean now it's much better but before it was not at all yeah. um, Still a little bit tricky, of course, because we know who controls pretty much everything. But the identity of each person is very, very much um, a space where people are really throwing themselves into to, to create these identities of certain areas in certain countries and not just being a generalized thing, which I think is fantastic. Um, yeah. and there needs to be much more to the Middle East for the summer, uh, European food, which country? I mean, just 
they're not the same. I yeah, mean, for sure. We share similarities, of course, but each country has its own pride in their own work and their history and their food. So you have to be very conscious and and uh, um, give people the credit for for their pasts. Okay, I want to ask you about specific dishes. Yes. Um, from from that first book, Palestine on a Plate. <laughs> Have has anyone made you dishes from this book and you taste them and you're like, what did you do? What, which what recipe did you follow? This is awful. Has have I been to someone's place and they've cooked me something from my book and I've eaten it? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you something, I'm the least cooked for person I know. Nobody wants to cook for me. Um, so I'm putting this out there. If anyone wants to invite me for dinner, please. Uh, I would love someone else to cook for me instead of me. Uh, but no, no one has, no, no one has, but they cook them and they show me and it looks fantastic. Um, but I haven't tried anyone else's okay. my book. Cause I'm always curious, like, um, if, if, uh, people in your position are like, no, this is the right way of doing it. This is the way you're, you're butchering my recipe. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I see things that people have shown me and between me yeah. and myself, I'm like, what the heck? This is, doesn't look like anything. But, <laughs> but everything <clears throat> has to start somewhere, right? When I first started cooking, I didn't know how to make things and I made mistakes. And I think when you make a mistake, you always never repeat that mistake again if someone tells you. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of making errors. Um, yeah. that's, that's where I learned how to be better, but I never tell anyone that it looks bad. I just tell them like, why don't you try adding a little bit of this and see yeah. how it turns out. And you have to always be positive when you're talking to somebody about something they've spent money on to buy the shopping and hours on cooking and preparing because yeah. it hurts when someone criticizes you. So I would never tell someone something was garbage. I would find a very nice way to let them know that there could be some other ways to make it a different yeah. way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you have, like you said, you have to be yeah. kind. You have to be kind and yeah. treat, people, treat people with respect because they've taken the time out. And I, I love that. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's a question for you. Let's say you were moving into a new home, okay? okay? And there's a beautiful kitchen in this new home. Yeah. All the, all the pots and the pans, they're all there, okay? Um, and you need to go to the grocery uh, store. And you're not about to make anything, but you need to just like fill the, the cabinets with the staples. Yeah. What are the staples that you are going to make sure that you can basically make anything? I mean, you're, you're going to have to go get fresh vegetables when you go for, get fresh vegetables, or you have to go get the meat when you go get the meat. But the sort of the basics, you open the fridge, this is what you want to see there in order to be able to cook up it, you know, most of the things you need. Give me that list. Give me the shopping list. Right. I already have it because this is like my life. I, my fridge and freezer is how I survive. I mean, obviously everybody does, but I've got stuff in here that I want to eat anything. I know that I have a freezer bag of it somewhere. So it would be all the, obviously this kusa that's showing now, this kusa is always in my fridge because I do kusa mafruke. I do this, I stuff them. I make all kinds of kusa. So that's in there. Okay. Tomatoes, parsley, spring onion, lamb neck for sure. Always some fillet of beef, prawns, my favorite. Um, and then fennel, beetroot, cucumber, but the Arabic ones. Um, and loads of green olives, loads and loads of lemon, loads of chilies, loads of olive oil is not in the fridge, but that's that's sort of apples and batikh. I have all this. And then the freezer is all the breads and all the things. But then my spices. Yes. The most important ones that I use, kamun, always, always. Cinnamon, nutmeg. No matter what your mother says. <laughs> Mama, I love you. Uh, kamun, nutmeg, cinnamon, salt, black pepper. 
and chili flakes, hine, obviously zata, frike. I have all the things from this lovely company called Zaytun, which I have. Dates, obviously, are always in my house. Um, olive oil, loads of it. Chickpea, jars. The thing is, my mom, I don't know why, but maybe from her mom, because of probably what happened with the neck burn, like evacuating and escaping and having to store food and life and clothes and things. They, I don't know if, it, I think it's every Arab, but I'm just associating with this because we're Palestinian, but we have enough food storage for months. So she- Yeah, Muni. Yeah, literally. Like I have 25 yeah. tins of chopped tomatoes, 25 tins of chickpeas, tomato puree, I have, and I'm one person, I have kilos of rice, every different kind of rice, <laughs> every different kind of, when we went into lockdown, everybody was running to buy stuff. And I was just sort of looking, I was like, I'm good. <laughs> it's like, my mom prepared us for a pandemic without realizing, um, yeah. but everything, but you know, you need, you need just few things. I say a few things, but I just named a hundred things. Yeah, you just named a hundred. <laughs> you need a hundred things and you'll be good. Um, I like to um, obviously cook. I like to eat what I want to eat when I can. So there's always milkhier frozen in the, you know, frozen packs um, and phyllo pastry and shari and everything and uh, knafe pastry. There's anything I have, anything I want so I can just cook what I feel like. So I can whip up anything quickly. I don't want to keep popping out to get stuff. So when I yeah. see there's three things left of one thing, I bring more. So there's always nothing comes to zero in my house. And I think <laughs> it's a good way. Inshallah, Damon. Yeah, inshallah, yeah. I think if you do little small increments of shopping, you never feel the big smack of the purchase when you do like a hundred, two hundred dollar purchase. I buy little things in increments here and there. My yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a dish that um, took you such a long time to master that's like in, in this sort of uh, in the book or one of the yeah. ones that you, yeah. Yeah, I think um, learning how to roll the water in yeah. perfect size with this right amount of filling um, so they wouldn't burst or become like big cigars. They're awful when they're big. Yeah, yeah they're just awful. They need to be yeah. little and thin. And it took me so, I have big hands, right? I'm six foot tall. My mom's smaller than me. Her hands are petite. She takes a bit and she puts it, she rolls it. And I'm like, Mabi Kaffi. She's like, Mabi Kaffi. I'm like, Mabi Kaffi. And she's like, just watch you've been eating it and I make it and I try but my little is and her little is not the same because our hands are different so I had to like pick her rice portion up from her water to feel how much it is in my hand and then do it it took me like six or seven times to make it perfect and now now I can say I can do it but I still haven't perfected it. She's lying to me. There's something she's putting. <laughs> There's something she's putting that she's not telling me because my wada is like a nine out of 10 or let's say eight out of 10 and hers is a 10 out of 10. This way, it's the, it's the kamun. Like. There's a hidden kamun that you're not putting. <laughs> but there's no kamun in my wada. <laughs> but yeah, it took. that's what took me the longest time uh, yeah. to, to yeah, because the big uh, what? Uh, no. Yeah, no, it's not they're tricky. tricky. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, about Baladi. Yes. What's the idea behind this book? I know I know a lot less about Baladi than I do about Palestine on a plate. Baladi is. I mean, I don't know if I can say this, but I can because it's mine. It's my preferred book out of the two. On two, con on two reasons. One, because it's a bigger book and it has a hundred photos of Palestine in it, which I didn't have in the first, which I wasn't, not allowed to. I, they didn't think it was the right way to go. Yeah. Um, so having that in there, flicking through, you feel like you're walking through Palestine from yeah. the top to the bottom. Number one. Number two, I had more freedom to sort of get the uh, pictures photographed the way I really wanted them to look. 
uh, I had more freedom because of the success of Palestine on a plate. They sort of trusted me to sort of have a bit more control over this one. And this book is mainly um, sort of focusing around the foods from my family who are living in the diaspora in Egypt and Jordan and Syria and the rest of the world. As you, if you've seen it, there's lots of recipes that are traditionally Syrian or Egyptian or whatever Jordanian, but cooked by my family who are Palestinian, who learned them when they were living there and made them their own. But still recognizing that Mansaf is Jordanian and Daoud Basha is Syrian and so on and so on. Amali is Egyptian. Yeah. Um, we don't like to take people's identity away from us as we don't like people to take ours away from ourselves. So yeah, for sure. The acknowledgement where something comes from, but this is more the recipes from a lot of them are still Palestinian, but there's a lot of recipes from other Middle Eastern countries um, that have influenced my family. And I think people have to remember that those 800,000 people that fled for their lives after the Nakba went somewhere and settled and became part of the communities and they learned to adapt and, and, and to be part of them. So this is a yeah. nod back to say thank you and uh, we love your food. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about one of the other projects that you have going on, which is these aprons. Tell us a little yeah. bit about what the the apron project are. You have them next to you. I do, yes. Uh, I I have a very good friend of mine. Her name is Krista. I think she's actually on here listening to us. We she's a, uh, a illustrator, designer, and we've been going back and forth talking about whether we should do something. And we decided to initially make an apron for the kitchen, which had like iconic symbols of Palestine, of food and places. So it took us a few months to kind of come up with, you know, there are so many things I couldn't. Yeah. We, had, we, we had like about 40 things we had to like reduce and take out and put back and see which ones people identified with the most. Uh, and then we thought we'd make a tea towel and a tote bag to go with them. And we launched them last week. And out of the, we only made a small collection of 300 pieces and we've only got about nine left. Uh, cool. You got you to gotta hold one up and show it. Okay, so these ones, I'll show you. <laughs> so this is the tote bag, and they're made, yeah. it's made from like organic cotton. I don't know if you can see, but we've got what are Anab and Kusa. We've got the coffee with the cups that are made from Hebron and Khalil. We've got falafel and, and tahine. Then you've got kak and uds and sakhan, khyar and halloumi tomato. Then uh, uh, uds here, the soap from Nablus, knafe, tahine. Uh, oranges and yaffa so we've placed everything in the areas they come from and then of course Gaza, nice. we have the and the fish and this is the bag we have a tea towel um and we're also donating from the sales uh money to the house of friendship in nablus which i've been uh, working with my u.s publisher and this is the apron which i love oh, nice. organic fair trade we try to use the best products we can um, yeah, so we're donating some of the proceeds from the sales to the House of Friendship in Nablus, which I've been working with my US publisher, sit with Veladi and Palestine on a plate, and um, it's a charity for children. And with the money we raised from selling my books, we renovated the school from inside and also, you know, made a safe space for children to be. So, you know, I think it's always nice to do something cute and fun, but with a cause. Yeah, for sure. No, you know, we have to help as much as we can back home. And that's- I love it. Yeah, so these are um, what we, we just sort of came up with. Well, not just, we've been thinking about them for months and they've just arrived uh, today. So, so nice. I'm out, yeah. Okay, so last question before we go to the, the single dish that you chose, is, which is, where's the best kinefe come from? What? Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Okay, can I say only... <laughs> <laughs> How do you say kinefe? You say kinefe, kinefe. I say kinefe. I mean, I have a very Lebanese accent. 
No, no, because there's people who say Knafe and Knafe. We're Knafe people. Yeah. Okay. I haven't been to Palestine because I'm not allowed to enter. But so I would like to say Palestine. Okay. But because I haven't been to Palestine, the best Knafe I've eaten is in Jordan. Um, mm. And uh, if I was allowed into Palestine, I would hope that Palestinian knafe is better, but I can't say that, but it is. Uh, but yeah, Jordanian knafe name is the best knafe ever. Uh, okay. Are you a knafe khishne person or a knafe name? Uh, name. Oh, thank God. The, the question is, the question is, um, in kak or not? That's another question. Not. Okay. You? For in for sure. Oh my god, it's like a carbicide. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah no, I'm I'm out. No, no. <laughs> no. Okay, let's let's uh, talk about the favorite dish uh, or not favorite dish, but for matbakh, we always ask our guests to choose one dish or technique or ingredient, and you chose fette. Yeah. Tell us a little bit why you chose fette. Okay, fette. I mean, I don't know anyone who doesn't like fette. Fette means anything like which has shredded or toasted bread underneath, which would technically soak up any sauce or fluid that comes on top of it. Um, firstly, I love fried bread. And number two, I love anything that soaks into fried bread. And this is basically, mm. you can make it with anything. My favorite fette, I mean, I'm going to say all, all of them. There's fette hummus, love it. Fette betinjan. Yeah delicious because we, we make it with like a tamarind sauce and tomato yeah, fettid bit and gin is amazing. Uh, fettid jaj. I did it in a supper club a few weeks ago a lot of people were like what we're eating minced lamb with rice mixed with chicken and broth and yogurt and garlic and chili and bread they thought that it was crazy they were eating it they loved it because they're not Arabs so they were just thinking what the hell is going on here yeah there has to be the greatest idea in the world, you could just put anything in your fridge and make it effective. So it's one of those sort of store cupboard raids that can happen very quickly, or you can take your time with it, like doing fettet lahme, uh, which it's like lamb neck that needs to be cooked very yeah. slow. So, um, and of course the rice soaking into all the uh, things, but I think you should definitely, if anyone has my books or has the internet, Google Fete, make something and tell me what you think later. It's so soothing. I feel like I'm eating a hug, uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> it makes, Amazing. Me feel, makes me feel good. Um, so, yeah. Amazing, that's, yeah. That's the most important dish for me. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's do the quick Q&A then. If there are any questions in the audience, we'll take some of them. So... Um, first question is, what have you been reading or watching these days? I was so hoping someone was going to ask me this because I was just about to interrupt you and say, please watch Fadha on Netflix. Okay. It's a Palestinian movie that has just yeah. come out about the Nakba, which I'm so happy. I'm not shocked that it's on Netflix. I'm feeling that things are slightly changing. Uh, so please, if you can watch it, it's beautiful. It's depressing it's painful it's real and uh, the Israeli government are trying to get Netflix to take it off because they don't want to acknowledge that the Nakba happened even though they just said it last week that they were telling Palestinians remember what happened in 1948 but today they're telling everyone it didn't happen so Farha Netflix watch yeah it. you know it's I just reached out to the director I'm hoping that we can have I think it's a uh... Uh, a woman by the name of Darin. I'm uh, uh, hoping that we can have her on a uh, movie night. I would love to hear her talking about it. So yes, that's what yeah. I'm watching. I'm telling everyone about it. I think Palestinians need, not just Palestinians, people need to keep supporting Palestinians because the, the, the Israeli machine is so powerful. Uh, people don't really realize uh, what actually is happening behind the scenes. So just support anyone. And yeah. most of the people are, 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 are little people trying to make big impacts and we can only do it with you. Otherwise, we'd just be sitting at home twiddling our For sure. Yeah. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Shadow in cooking or just in life? To spend a day with. Mm, uh, probably... Mm, Mahmoud Darwish. 
Nice. Okay. <laughs> we'll keep going. Great choice. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, what is your guilty pleasure midnight food choice? Um, probably nothing so crazy. It's probably two things, chocolate fudge brownie ice cream and uh, salted and sweet popcorn that I make myself. I don't like to buy ready made anything except for ice cream. <laughs> amazing. Uh, That's so amazing. Good. Um, and what dish reminds you most of home? Um, Luchia. Definitely. Um, my mom, uh, it's, the, it's the thing I make the most when I'm feeling low and I miss her or I feel, hey, something's missing and I yeah. just fill myself up with it. So yeah, Yeah, amazing. Okay, we have one question from the chat, which I will ask uh, for Noha. There's actually yes, two questions. The first question is, why are you not allowed in Palestine? And the second question is, how do I get the aprons? <laughs> I'm not, I got banned uh, in 2016 for writing Palestine on a plate. And they thought, well, they think, they said that my book is anti-Semitic and I'm delegitimizing the Israeli race because I'd never mentioned them in the book. I don't see why I had to because they did not exist in pre-1948. And these recipes are... Uh, from my grandmother and my mom uh, when there was no Israel. So yeah, I got banned. And also our family, for whatever reason, is not allowed to enter, like millions of other people uh, have no right to return to the country. So I think it sort of trickled on from there and just became cemented that, yeah, they don't want me there. And how can yeah. we get the aprons? Uh, yeah. These are um, uh, on my website, uh, palestineonaplate.com um and yeah there's just a few left so uh i would love it if you guys get the last ones <laughs> yeah they look amazing i'm gonna have to get one myself um yeah. judy i really appreciate you taking time to talk to us um i'm a huge fan of your work i love i need to meet the steph character yeah. um and i love the fact that you are a reluctant food influencer <laughs> because you like you, you keep on saying you're like i'm bad at all this and then you have like hundreds of thousands of followers and you're massively successful um and i love that you're so nonchalant about all of it thank you yeah i i listen you got to do it for the cause i love where i'm from i love everybody i want us to have a voice that is ours not someone else giving it to us yeah. and um this is this is the only way we can do it so i'm like between like a super activist slash super chef because my page has now become like death and terror and then um Zachan, and then death and, yeah. and then Ma'lube. Uh, i can't find everyone's like you've got to pick one thing i'm like no i don't it's my page I can okay. do one, so yeah it's, it's a pleasure to to to, to do it um yeah well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your your work and perspective with us. Um, it's a huge thrill to talk to you. Thank you. It was so nice to have to be on here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.